when in 1882 an Odessa cantor chanted, All the nations reside on their land, but Israel wanders the earth like a shadow finding no rest, receiving no brotherly welcome, his congregants audibly sobbed. Eugene F. Sofer The tragic history of the Jews as a people wandering the world through centuries of persecution has been equally remarkable for their achievements, perhaps unique for any population of similar size. Even after the modern state of Israel was created in the middle of the twentieth century, most of the Jews in the world were still the Jews of the Diaspora. As of 1990, there were approximately 13 million Jews in the world, of whom 90% lived in just five countries, with nearly three-quarters living either in the United States or in Israel. There were nearly 9 million Jews of the Diaspora and almost 4 million Jews living in their historic homeland of Israel, which contained 31% of all the Jews in the world. Unlike any other people, the Jews of the world are today a smaller population than they were more than half a century ago, before the Holocaust. The Jews of the Diaspora have been very thinly spread among the populations of the countries in which they live. Even in the United States, with the largest Jewish population in the world, Jews were only about 2% of the population. Yet the only country with a higher percentage was Israel. The world Jewish population in 1990 was distributed as follows. United States, 5,535,000. Israel, 3,946,700. Soviet Union, 1,150,000. France, 530,000. Britain, 315,000. All others, 1,329,700. Total, 12,806,400. The diaspora of the Jews has been more than simply a worldwide dispersion. Many peoples have been widely dispersed throughout the world, but the bulk of those peoples have usually remained in their respective homelands. What has been historically unique about the Jewish diaspora has been a combination of features, including, one, the vast majority of a whole people living outside their historic homeland, two, the loss of that homeland, both demographically and politically, to other peoples, and three, an ever-changing pattern of dispersion, with the largest concentration of Jews in the world being at one time in Eastern Europe, at another time in the Islamic countries, and today in the United States. If the overseas Chinese are numerically the largest of the world's middleman minorities, Jews are the best known in that role, the classic image of the middleman. The Chinese have been called the Jews of Southeast Asia, and the Lebanese the Jews of West Africa. Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice was Jewish. Jewish peddlers, shopkeepers, pawnbrokers, merchants, and bankers have historically created an image that still survives, even in countries where contemporary Jews are more likely to be doctors, lawyers, or intellectuals. Their history has been profoundly affected by the fact that so many Jews were middlemen, whatever they may be today. Ancient Times In ancient times, Jews were neither a race of middlemen nor a people without a country. However, there were Jewish communities far from Israel, centuries before Christ. The conquest of Israel by the Assyrians in the 8th century BC led to the removal of more than 27,000 Jews, the lost tribes, who disappeared without a trace in the lands of the conquerors. Successive conquerors dispersed more and more Jews over the centuries, whether as prisoners, refugees, or migrants, but these Jews retained their identity and loyalty, exemplified in the phrase, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem. There were not only mass exoduses of Jews, but also mass returns. In the 6th century BC, the Persian conquerors of Babylon permitted its Jewish population to return to their homeland and rebuild the temple at Jerusalem. Although 50,000 returned, many others remained abroad. But these Jews of the Diaspora continued to make financial contributions, as well as pilgrimages, to the Temple in Jerusalem. In the first century B.C., the Romans captured Jerusalem. They ruled for the next several centuries, despite two massive revolts in the first and second centuries A.D., which led only to the destruction of the Temple, the obliteration of Israel as a political entity, and the dispersal of the great majority of the Jewish people. 
the Jews became, and remained for almost two thousand years, a people without a country. They were a minority everywhere, including the area once known as Israel, but now renamed by the Romans Syria-Palestina. Even before the obliteration of ancient Israel as a political entity, Jews were widely scattered throughout the Roman Empire. Out of an estimated 8 million Jews in the world at that time, only about 2.5 million lived in Palestine. Approximately 4 million lived in the rest of the Roman Empire, and another million in Babylonia. Jews were about 10% of the total population of the Roman Empire, and they tended to concentrate in urban areas. There were about 50,000 Jews living in Rome itself, and Jews constituted about 40% of the population of Alexandria, where they were prominent in the grain export trade, both as ship owners and as sailors. The range of occupations open to Jews at this period was greater than in later medieval times. In addition to being merchants trading domestically and internationally, Jews were also artisans, farmers, and mercenary soldiers. While wealthy Jews attracted attention, most Jews were in fact poor. Most earned their livings from manual labor, and some were beggars on the streets, in both Rome and Alexandria. Nevertheless, the success of Jewish businessmen, though it advanced the economies in which they settled, provoked envy and hostility among non-Jewish businessmen, mostly pagans, rather than Christians in the early era of the Diaspora. The vicissitudes of the Jews under the Roman Empire, or in the contemporary Persian Empire, were very different from their troubles in medieval and modern times. Both empires were multi-ethnic and multi-religious. Tolerance was a necessity for the survival of the realm. Each of the numerous groups in the Roman Empire was expected to respect the rights of others, the gods of others, and to pay homage both to the political rulers and to the gods of Rome. Otherwise, they were free to pursue their own religion and their own way of life. Jews had a special difficulty in fitting into this Roman scheme. While other peoples had their own gods for themselves, the god of the Jews was conceived as the one god of all mankind and of the universe. While this might, in one sense, suggest the brotherhood of man, in another sense it led to the conclusion that all other religions were false, that it was a sacrilege to accept them in any way, much less pay even formal homage to them. It was this feature of Judaism, and later Christianity, that provoked special political problems for the Jews, and later the Christians, in the Roman Empire. This view was also characteristic of the third great religion of the Middle East, Islam, which emerged in a still later era. Pagans were not intolerant of other religions. It was the Judeo-Christian tradition that introduced religious intolerance into the Roman Empire, and through it into Western civilization. Over the ensuing centuries, no one suffered more as a result than the Jews. Not all anti-Jewish hostility was religiously based, even when it invoked religious feelings. The prime modern examples were the Nazis, who were by no means religious. Hostility among peoples as such goes far back into human history. Hostility between Greeks and Jews, for example, led to violence in many cities during Roman times despite strong measures taken by the Romans to suppress such outbreaks, which were seen as a threat to public order and ultimately to the stability of the empire. By and large, the Romans attempted to accommodate the special religious views of the Jews, though particular Roman rulers offended their religion in various ways. Nevertheless, Roman rule was found burdensome in other respects, including taxation, and the Romans could be implacable in vengeance against Jews, as against other peoples. After the Second Revolt in Jerusalem, vast numbers of Jews were either slaughtered or sold into slavery. But the singling out of Jews for special oppression and violence, just for being Jews, was something that still lay centuries into the future. The Middle Ages When the last Roman emperor was overthrown in 476 A.D., marking the end of the ancient world and the beginning of the Middle Ages, Jews were widely scattered around the Mediterranean and could be found farther north in Europe, as well as farther south in the Arabian Peninsula. Much of this region was destined to be conquered in later centuries by adherents of the new and crusading religion of Islam. During the Middle Ages, most Jews lived in the Islamic world. That world extended from Spain across North Africa and the Middle East into Central Asia. Moreover, 
It was an expanding world that would eventually conquer the Balkans in Europe, establish the Mughal Empire in India, and reach Southeast Asia via Arab traders to make Islam the religion of regions that later became Malaysia and Indonesia. Like Christians and other non-Muslims, Jews in the Islamic lands were legally placed on an inferior plane, but in practice they were treated far better in much of the Muslim world at that time than in the contemporary Christian world. However, the treatment of Jews varied among Islamic countries, as among Christian countries, and in both their treatment changed over time as well. Throughout the Islamic world, a non-Muslim dared not strike a Muslim, even in self-defense, and merely verbal retaliation was dangerous. Small children threw rocks at Christians or Jews with impunity, a fate not uncommon for Jews in parts of contemporary Christendom. Self-protection being forbidden and fatally dangerous, the protection of non-Muslim minorities in Islamic countries depended crucially on the practices of the authorities and the attitudes of the populace. Religious differences provided the basis for hostility to Jews in both the Christian world and the Islamic world, but the wide variations in the actual treatment of Jews within each world did not correspond with religious variations. Certainly the historic reversal of the positions of the two civilizations over a period of centuries in their respective treatment of Jews cannot readily be attributed to religion. Indeed, slaughters of Jews occurred in North Africa and the Middle East before the rise of either Christianity or Islam. Among the factors influencing the better treatment of Jews in Muslim lands during the early Middle Ages was that Jews were less conspicuous as only one of a number of non-Muslim minorities in the Islamic world, while they stood out sharply as the only non-Christian people in Christian Europe at a time when religion was an enormous influence. Moreover, the early Islamic world was a confident, dynamic world, a world expanding for a thousand years, winning repeated military victories over European powers, singly or in combination. The Ottoman Empire became the most powerful military force on earth, nor were all its achievements on the battlefield. The culture of the Islamic world was in many respects more advanced and more sophisticated than that of contemporary Europe, especially in mathematics and philosophy, for example. In later centuries, when the great tides of history turned in favor of Europe, it was the Ottoman Empire and the Islamic world in general that suffered innumerable crushing defeats, saw their conquered territories in Europe lost, and saw Muslims across North Africa and the Middle East become subjugated by Europeans. In this later era of defeat and dangers, the confident cosmopolitanism of the early Ottoman Empire gave way to more bitter reactions to non-Muslims, of whom Jews were the most vulnerable. The history of Jews in medieval Europe took a very different course from the history of Jews in Islamic lands. In the fragmented Europe left after the fall of the Roman Empire, Barbarian invaders took over many areas where Jews had lived since ancient times. Like other pagans, these barbarian conquerors were tolerant of religious differences, and Jews were able to survive, and in some places thrive among them. With the passing centuries, however, the barbarians became Christianized, and that entailed affiliation with an international church dedicated to stamping out deviations from Christian orthodoxy. Even after the pagans became Christianized, there remained a social toleration and mutual interaction for centuries more, giving little foreshadowing of the persecutions of Jews that would become widespread in Europe during the later Middle Ages. As a literate people during the widespread ignorance of a dark age, Jews enjoyed a certain prestige among their Christian neighbors. Even Jewish peddlers brought products and ideas from a wider world to the provincial communities of early medieval Europe. Centuries of religious preaching against Jews were required to turn them into pariahs in the popular mind. Jews as artisans, peddlers, and merchants played a role in the revival of European urban communities after the collapse of the Roman Empire. Jews lived in many European cities, including Rome, Frankfurt, and Lyon. Their urban occupations included goldsmiths and physicians, and their rural occupations owners of farms and vineyards. Jews were in the entourages of aristocrats and supplied them with exotic luxuries from the East. Christians during this era socialized with Jews and dined in their homes, and many converted to Judaism, though few Jews converted to Christianity. Recognizing the dangers to Christianity 
and to itself as an institution in such situations, the Catholic Church counterattacked in various ways, intellectual and political. The net result was a growth of policies, laws, and practices which kept Christians and Jews apart, forbade proselytizing by Jews, and restricted or harassed them in the practice of their own religion. Ironically, these policies worked so effectively that eventually popular anti-Jewish hostility reached levels that caused a succession of popes to issue edicts against anti-Jewish violence and libels, the most infamous libel being that Jews killed Christian babies and drank their blood. In an earlier era, the same accusation had been made by pagans against the Christians. Despite growing restrictions and persecutions, many Jews continued to prosper. Indeed, Jews became preeminent in international trade between Christian Europe and the Muslim lands, partly because both saw them as neutrals in the great Christian-Muslim struggles of that era, allowing them to function economically in both worlds, where Christians restricted Muslims and Muslims restricted Christians. These functions as both economic and cultural intermediaries could be carried out because the Jews of Europe had contacts with fellow Jews in North Africa and the Middle East, many of the latter also being merchants. Part of the exports from Europe to the Islamic world during this era, and for centuries to come, were European slaves. In an era when large land ownership in Europe often meant holding serfs and slaves, Jewish landowners were no exception. Moreover, in their role as international traders in various merchandise, the Jews, like the Arabs in Africa, included slaves among that merchandise. As the Germanic peoples of Western Europe invaded the Slavic lands to the east, they often sold members of the conquered population as slaves to Jews, who then resold them elsewhere in the Christian or Islamic world. Jews became major dealers in the European slave trade, as in other trade. The growing spread of Christianity in Europe and its influence on secular law increasingly made it illegal for Jews to own Christian slaves and also increasingly difficult for them to own land. Christians, Jews, and Muslims all banned the holding of their own people as slaves, but all three held other peoples as slaves. In the Ottoman Empire, Jews continued to function as slave traders for centuries, selling European Christians to Muslims. With castration being forbidden to Muslims, Jews were the principal suppliers of white eunuchs to the Ottoman Empire in the 15th century, the supply coming largely from the Caucasus region. In Europe, along with a growing antagonism toward the Jews by Christian religious authorities and those influenced by them, there was a more pragmatic and more ambivalent response to the Jews by rulers of nations. The skills and entrepreneurship of the Jews were important economic contributions to national development, as well as providing contributions more directly to the rulers in loans and taxes. Therefore, rulers often protected Jews from the violence of mobs. At other times, however, rulers found it expedient to use Jews as scapegoats for popular discontents. One symptom of this ambivalence among rulers was that Jews were sometimes expelled and later invited back into the same realm. Despite their use of religious intolerance to stir public feeling against the Jews, various attacks, expulsions, and confiscations had pragmatic goals, including being rid of creditors and the debts owed to them. When King Philip of France expelled the Jews in 1306, the reason given was that they charged excessively high interest rates. However, he did not cancel the debts owed to Jews, but instead set about collecting them for his own treasury. To his disappointment, the king discovered that the money collected in this way was less than the taxes that Jews had been paying. Moreover, when Christian moneylenders replaced Jews, complaints arose that Christians charged higher interest rates than the Jews had. The net result was that the Jews were invited back. The same cycle of expulsion followed by an invitation to return appeared in several medieval German cities. There was a more lasting expulsion of Jews from England in 1290 and from France in 1394. Various cities and regions also expelled Jews, Cologne in 1424, Augsburg in 1439, and Moravia in 1454, for example. The series of crusades of Christian Europe against the Muslims in Palestine produced major tragedies for Jews in Europe. As bands of crusaders marched across the continent, unruly elements among them paused to attack Jews. 
the slaughters of 1096 took 10,000 Jewish lives in Central Europe. Violent attacks on Jews likewise marked later crusades. Popular hostility to Jews again vented itself in the wake of the Black Death, or bubonic plague, of the 14th century, which killed between a fourth and a half of the entire population of Europe. Rumors spread that the Jews had somehow caused the plague, and this set off murderous violence against Jewish inhabitants in hundreds of European cities. While the ignorance of the masses in Europe during this era was no doubt a factor in such attacks on Jews, it was often the educated clergy who were leaders in whipping up anti-Jewish feeling in the interests of solidifying Christian hegemony, and often it was years before the anti-Judaism of the educated took root in the masses. This pattern was to be repeated in later eras of secular intellectuals, who also required long years of determined effort to inculcate anti-Jewish hostility into the masses. With the passing centuries and growing intolerance, the occupations open to Jews began to narrow, as did their choice of residence, or even the clothing they were permitted to wear. Land ownership, military careers, and many occupations represented by the emerging guilds were closed to Jews in many parts of medieval Europe. In many countries, they were left with occupations peripheral to feudal society, peddlers, artisans, or moneylenders on a small or large scale, for example. In some places, Jews also became rent collectors for noble landlords or tax collectors for governments, roles which added to their unpopularity. Rulers began to require Jews to wear clothes or insignia that distinguished them from Christians. Similar requirements to wear special clothing were imposed on Jews in some Islamic lands to distinguish them from Muslims. Jews in much of Europe were also required to live in separate communities from Christians. Sometimes these were walled communities, which Jews were forbidden to leave at night, the ghettos, which later in history became a generic term for residential enclaves of other groups around the world. As the Jews settled for centuries in lands with different races, religions, languages, and cultures, the evolution of Jewish culture reflected these differences in the respective cultures around them as well as reflecting the opportunities and rights those cultures permitted or denied to Jews. Language was the most obvious example. Jews of the Byzantine Empire typically spoke Greek, while those in Arab lands spoke Arabic, and those in various parts of Europe spoke either the regionally dominant language or a Jewish dialect derived from it, such as Yiddish derived from German or Ladino from Spanish. Within their own enclaves, Jews typically maintained autonomous institutions, both secular and religious, and were collectively responsible through their leaders to the ruling powers for order and for taxes. The world of the ghettos was in many countries and for many centuries a narrow world, largely insulated from the cultural developments of Christian Europe and preoccupied with Jewish traditions and contemporary Jewish problems. Education remained more common among the Jews than among many of the Christian communities around them, but for most it was an education as circumscribed as the lives they led. Contacts were maintained, at least intermittently, by the more educated classes with other Jewish communities in other lands, though the language barriers that increasingly separated world Jewry were formidable to those who were not multilingual. Commerce likewise connected the Jews in different lands, as the Jews themselves connected in trade countries that were hostile to one another, especially those of Christian Europe and the Islamic world. One of the major divisions within world Jewry developed between the Ashkenazic Jews of Germany and the Sephardic Jews of Spain, each named for the Hebrew word for their respective countries of residence, though the names stuck long after later migrations took them far from these countries. The late 15th century, for example, saw two mass migrations of historic consequence, Ashkenazic Jews migrating from German lands into Poland and Sephardic Jews migrating from Spain to the Mediterranean Islamic countries. Throughout the centuries of the diaspora, whether the circumstances of the Jews in particular lands were good or bad, these circumstances were subject to sudden and drastic change. Centuries of persecution in the Byzantine Empire, for example, were followed by an era of renewed toleration and economic advancement, leading to a prosperous Jewish community in Constantinople. Elsewhere, the sequence was the reverse, from toleration and prosperity to intolerance and spoliation. 
Spain went through the latter cycle on a large scale more than once. Spain A large and prosperous Jewish population lived in Spain for centuries before the Visigoths established a kingdom there in the 5th century A.D. In the early Middle Ages in Spain, as in other parts of Europe, Jews were not as limited in their occupations as they became in a later era. In addition to being merchants in both domestic and international trade, Jews also held civil and military offices in the Visigothic government and were large landowners and slaveholders. After the Visigoths began to abandon paganism for Christianity, beginning with the Visigothic king Ricared in 589, a new era began. Ricared himself did not begin persecuting Jews, nor did his immediate successors, but his religious conversion and that of his kingdom provided a religious basis for severe 7th century restrictions on Jews by later kings, typically for political reasons or economic gain. Religion was an enabling rather than an impelling force. Most of the Catholic Visigothic kings did not adopt anti-Jewish policies, and, even in the late 7th century, some Catholic clergy themselves continued the illegal practice of selling Christian slaves to Jews. Whatever the reasons behind growing restrictions on Jews in Spain, these restrictions became widespread and severe. The death penalty was decreed for Jews who proselytized Christians, and Jews were ordered expelled from government posts where they exercised power over Christians. When Jews were forbidden to hold Christian slaves, this was an economic blow both to slave owners and to landowners, especially since Jewish landowners were also forbidden from hiring Christian employees. After these and other anti-Jewish policies decreed by King Sisabut were applied unevenly across the country against various resistance, neglect, and evasion by local civil and church authorities, he eventually simply ordered that Jews either convert to Christianity or leave the country. However, Sisabut died in 621 A.D., before this draconian policy could be fully carried out, and his successor reversed Sisabut's anti-Jewish policies in general. But a decade later, these anti-Jewish policies resumed under a new regime. However, their implementation continued to be problematical, as both civil and religious authorities often found it expedient to use the talents of Jews, who sometimes even administered ecclesiastical estates of Catholic clergy. In short, the actual implementation of policy toward the Jews reflected the conflict between the economic usefulness of Jews and their political, social, and religious unpopularity. Although many Jews remained in Spain, and some continued to engage in lucrative but forbidden economic activities at the end of the 7th century, they nevertheless welcomed the Moors who invaded Spain in the early 8th century. The conquering Moors brought to the Jews more than a respite from persecution. The vast Islamic domains, of which Spain now became part, offered many opportunities for trade, not only within itself, but also between itself and Christian Europe. The Jews, widely scattered in both civilizations, and yet in contact with fellow Jews living in both Christian and Islamic countries, were in an ideal position to conduct that trade. They became a conduit, not only for trade, but also for intellectual and cultural interchanges between the two hostile blocks of nations. The seven centuries of Moorish rule in Spain included three centuries, 900 to 1200 A.D., which have often been called the Golden Age of Jews, not only for their economic achievements, but also for their intellectual and cultural development. The Islamic world of this era was itself a source of new ideas in science, poetry, and philosophy. A rich Moorish architectural tradition left its monuments across Spain. Many cultural treasures came in the Arabic language, including classics not only from the Middle East and North Africa, but also classics of Greek civilization and even from as far away as India, all written in Arabic or translated into Arabic. In this way, a whole new system of numbers, originating in India, reached Europe and replaced the cumbersome system of Roman numerals. Because these numbers came to Europe by way of the Arabs, they were mistakenly called Arabic numerals. Chess likewise originated in India and reached Europe via the Arab conquerors. Much of the literature that entered Spain in Arabic was retranslated into European languages and became part of the cultural heritage of European civilization. Jews were an important part of this translation process. 
Standing at the crossroads of two great civilizations, the Jews were peculiarly well situated to deal in the ideas and cultures of both the Islamic and the Christian worlds, as well as in their material goods, and to advance themselves culturally and materially as well. It was not simply that they received knowledge from different directions, but that these cultural cross-currents also stimulated their own thinking and the development of their own Jewish culture. For example, the Islamic world's concern for the purity of the Arabic language stimulated Jews to re-examine Hebrew grammar and style. After many centuries in which Jewish intellectual efforts, as embodied in their writings, concentrated on specifically Jewish matters and virtually ignored science, now, in the wake of Arab science, Jews began to produce numerous scientific works during the centuries of Islamic rule in Spain. The most famous Jewish philosopher of the Middle Ages, Maimonides, was a product of such cultural cross-currents, being familiar with both Greek and Arab philosophers, as well as with his own Judaic traditions. At less exalted levels of the Jewish community as well, both Islamic and Christian cultural features influenced the Jewish culture. Despite the duration and achievements of Islamic rule in Spain and Portugal, the Moors never fully occupied the Iberian Peninsula. A band of Christian-ruled regions across the northern edge of the country held out, and eventually became bases for a long process of Christian reconquest that lasted for centuries. Portugal became independent in the 12th century, and the Christian kingdoms of Spain won major victories in the early 13th century that gave them control of most of their country's territory, but the Moors still retained the kingdom of Granada in the south. The military struggle in Spain continued on through most of the 15th century. But, as early as the 13th century, Christian-ruled Spain encompassed a majority of Sephardic Jews. Most of these Jews were in such occupations as craftsmen, shopkeepers, or moneylenders, but some reached higher levels as owners of large textile factories in Seville, Cordoba, and Toledo, or as government financial administrators and tax collectors. The Jews excelled in those mundane skills neglected by Castilian society, and this complementarily benefited both economically. However, the prosperity and influence of the Jews were increasingly resented by the Spanish populace, who were held in check only by a strong central government, well aware of the benefit it derived from the work of Jews. When the bubonic plague, or Black Death, that swept across Europe struck Spain, it contributed to a social disruption that undermined the power of the Spanish monarchy. A civil war within Christian Spain from 1369 to 1371 likewise weakened the government's control. During this disruption of order, a wave of anti-Jewish violence swept across the country, culminating in the forced conversion of tens of thousands of Jews in 1391. Neither church nor state was successful in their attempts to control these mob outbreaks or the forced conversions. Many other Jews, not directly coerced, chose on their own to become Christians, as it became increasingly dangerous to be a Jew. These events had lasting effects on the history of the Jews and on the history of Spain. The ethnically Jewish population was now split religiously three ways. One, those converted Jews who adhered to the Christian religion and who were called conversos. Two, those converts who secretly maintained Jewish religious observances and whom the Spaniards bitterly called maranos, or swine. And three, those Jews who remained open adherents of Judaism. The interactions among these three groups were to have fateful consequences. The conversos, now freed of the discriminatory laws that applied to Jews, became even more prosperous and influential, reaching high positions in church and state alike, and even marrying into the Christian aristocracy. Conversos became especially influential in municipal governments. But, however much their legal, economic, and social status may have changed, the conversos still aroused the envy and hostility of the populace, just as they had when they were Jews. Bloody outbreaks against conversos erupted in Toledo in 1448, in Sepulveda in 1468, in Cordova in 1473, and in Segovia and Jaén in 1474. There was also a widespread questioning of the large role of conversos in Spanish life, and charges that many conversos were actually maranos, secretly practicing Judaism.
the charge of religious apostasy from Christianity brought in the Spanish Inquisition. Though the Inquisition's powers were sweeping and its methods ruthless, still the Converso's power and influence enabled many to escape with their lives and much of their property. Attempts to curb the prosperity and influence of the Conversos centered on making a legal distinction between them and people born into the Christian community, the so-called Old Christians. In self-defense, the Conversos insisted on the unity of all Christians, whether by birth or conversion, as against the Jews. Both the logic of the argument and the social exigencies of the times led the Conversos into promoting anti-Jewish beliefs and policies, in a country already seething with hostility to Jews. Although the royal government still needed the skills, talents, and wealth of the Jews while engaged in a military struggle against the Moors, once Granada fell in 1492, ending Moorish rule in Spain, the Jews became expendable. A royal decree issued that same year expelled all religious Jews from the country. Unlike the expulsions of relatively small populations of Jews from England and France in previous centuries, the number of Jews suddenly forced out of Spain on short notice reached the hundreds of thousands. Wealth that the Jews were forced to leave behind helped finance the other great historic event of that year, the voyage of Columbus that led to discovery of the Western Hemisphere. Most of the Sephardic Jews went to the Islamic lands of North Africa and the Middle East, and in particular to the Ottoman Empire. Not all Sephardic Jews settled in the Ottoman Empire, however. Many settled in those European countries noted for their tolerance toward Jews, such as Italy, England, and Holland. The Spanish Jews who settled in Holland helped to make Amsterdam one of the world's great commercial ports, and came ultimately to own one-fourth of the shares in the Dutch East India Company. Existing Jewish communities scattered across the vast Ottoman Empire were not only swamped demographically by the huge influx of Jews from Spain, as well as from other parts of Europe, but were also revitalized by these new people, who were more advanced in both knowledge and wealth. Sephardic exiles rapidly rose to commercial prominence in the Balkans. The cosmopolitan Sephardim, who settled in southern France as Maranos, were both more prosperous and more accepted culturally than the poor, alien, and openly Jewish Ashkenazim, who settled in eastern France, which became strongly anti-Jewish. The Sephardic Jews who settled in Algeria became the acknowledged leaders of the Jewish community there, and leaders also of the commercial activities of the nation. Although the Spanish government had confiscated the wealth of the Sephardic Jews, they could not confiscate the skills and traits that created that wealth in the first place, and would create it again in many other nations, as far away as the Caribbean. The Ottoman Empire As of the late 15th century, the Ottoman Empire offered far greater tolerance and far more opportunities than the Jews were likely to find in most other places, Christian or Islamic. At that juncture, the Ottoman Empire was the most powerful military force in an expanding Islamic world, and more powerful than any European nation or empire. The Ottoman Turks climaxed their rise from a nomadic people to a world power by their invasion of the Byzantine Empire and capture of its capital, Constantinople, in 1453. Renamed Istanbul, this city now became the capital of the Ottoman Empire. As conquerors of a large, racially and religiously diverse region, the Ottoman Turks ruled with tolerance and shrewdness. The welcome they offered to Jews exiled from Spain reflected that shrewdness. Among the skills that the Sephardim brought to the Ottoman Empire was a knowledge of the military technology of the West and a knowledge of Western languages and Western politics. All this was valuable to the Ottoman rulers in their centuries-long hostilities against Christian Europe. The Ottoman Empire much preferred Jews to Christians in sensitive positions. For example, Jews were sometimes sent abroad as interpreters for Ottoman envoys, and even as unofficial emissaries themselves. Moreover, unlike the larger Christian minority within the Ottoman Empire, the Jews were under no cloud of suspicion of being sympathetic to the Christian nations after the persecutions they had suffered there. Indeed, the Ottoman rulers followed a policy of moving Jews into recently conquered Christian cities, whether because these cities were depopulated or as a counterweight to potentially disloyal Christian inhabitants. Jews in the Ottoman Empire were encouraged, or even ordered, to move into Istanbul, 
where they were 11% of the city's population by 1477. After the later arrival of Spanish and Italian exiles, the Jewish population of Istanbul grew to be several times as large by 1535, though the migration of many other groups to Istanbul make it uncertain how much the relative proportions may have changed. The same policy was later applied to the strategic port of Salonika, which had a negligible Jewish population in 1519, but became more than two-thirds Jewish in less than a century. Jews in the Ottoman Empire were allowed to engage in a much wider range of economic activities than in much of contemporary Europe. Indeed, their particular skills were more widely needed. Jewish peddlers were common in towns like Gallipoli and Salonika, and in the villages in their vicinity. Often these peddlers dealt in barter. At the other end of the economic scale, Jews were also prominent in international trade, particularly with countries where other Jews engaged in international trade. Thus, Jews played an important role in the Ottoman trade with Italy, but not in its trade with the Persian Gulf region or with India. The principal commodities traded by Ottoman Jews, both domestically and internationally, were textiles, clothing, threads, and leathers. Having been active in the textile industry of Spain, Jews were among the pioneers of the textile industry in the Ottoman Empire, and supplied a large proportion of the uniforms worn by the military corps of the Janissaries. Jews were so common in the customs service that many of the Ottoman customs receipts of that era were written in Hebrew. In the medical profession, in this earlier and more tolerant era, Jews in the Islamic world worked as colleagues of Muslim or Christian physicians. The Muslim world, once in advance of Europe in science and medicine, had fallen behind by the time the Jewish refugees from Spain, Italy, and other parts of Europe began arriving in large numbers during the 15th century. As bearers of medical skills now more advanced than those of the Islamic world, Jews became prominent as physicians, including some who became physicians to sultans of the Ottoman Empire. By the early 16th century, the palace medical staff consisted of 41 Jews and 21 Muslims. With the passage of time, however, the source of the Jews' superiority, their knowledge of Western medicine, declined as they lost touch with ongoing medical developments in the West. As second- and third-generation Sephardic Jews fell behind in medicine, they were replaced by Western-educated Greeks. In general, Christian minorities in the Ottoman Empire, such as Greeks and Armenians, kept in touch with Christian Europe, often sending their children there to be educated. Ottoman Christians were therefore more abreast of Western progress and retained their facility with Western languages and their contacts in Western countries. As the Western knowledge and connections of the Ottoman Jews became obsolete over time, they began to be displaced by Christians in field after field. Not only were Jewish doctors replaced by better qualified Greeks, Jewish merchants likewise saw their share of the empire's international trade dwindle to the vanishing point in competition with Christians. Armenian merchants, ship owners, entrepreneurs, and bankers played an increasing role in the Ottoman Empire at the expense of Jews from the late 18th century. Even in the theater, an early Jewish predominance eventually gave way to Armenian predominance. In addition to ousting Jews from various commercial and professional positions through the competition of superior skills, Christian minorities also actively promoted hostility to the Jews in Christian Europe and in the Islamic world, bringing to the latter the old claim that Jews killed children and drank their blood. As the Jews of the Ottoman Empire declined, both economically and demographically, their growing poverty was reflected in very low levels of education, and growing persecutions added to their demoralization. The new intellectual currents of European civilization in the era of the French Revolution made no such impact among Ottoman Jews as among Greeks and Armenians. Jews in the Ottoman Empire remained isolated even from contemporary intellectual currents among the Jews of Europe. As the position of the Jews was declining within the Ottoman Empire, so the empire itself was declining relative to its chief rival, Christian Europe. This represented a drastic reversal of international power, and its domestic repercussions had grim implications for non-Muslim minorities. After centuries of territorial expansion, the Ottoman Turks began to experience setbacks and then defeats. 
In its era of ascendancy, the Ottoman Empire repeatedly inflicted crushing military defeats on the Europeans, conquered Greece and the Balkans, and by 1529 were besieging Vienna. Only with the help of other European powers, who feared that the Turks would overrun the continent, was the fall of Vienna averted, and only barely averted at that. Centuries of expansion of the Islamic world in all directions gave the Ottoman Turks not only confidence in themselves and in their mission, but also contempt for the infidels of Europe, whom they so long surpassed in science and medicine as well as on the battlefield, and whom they continually enslaved in great numbers. For centuries, Ottoman rulers and even Ottoman scholars had no interest in European culture, and often lacked very basic knowledge of the continent and its inhabitants, beyond those with whom they had common frontiers. In short, Europe was regarded as beneath their notice, even though Ottoman scholars produced serious studies of India, China, and other foreign countries. With this attitude of utter disdain toward Europe, it was a special shock for the Ottoman Empire to begin to encounter a series of major military defeats from European powers using more advanced weapons and techniques of war. The year 1571 saw the loss of Ottoman control of the Mediterranean in a decisive naval battle against a combined papal, Spanish, and Venetian fleet. On land, it was 1664 when the Habsburg Empire inflicted the first major defeat suffered by the Ottoman Empire in a pitched battle. In 1683, when the Ottomans returned to besiege Vienna, they were not only resisted, but routed, despite having numerical superiority. It marked an historic turning point in the relationship between the two empires, and more broadly, between Christian Europe and the Islamic world. The degree of tolerance toward non-Muslim minorities within the Ottoman Empire during its long era of ascendancy was no longer maintained as the Ottomans began to experience the shocks of military defeat and of uprisings among European subject peoples, together with European subjugation of Muslims in North Africa and the Middle East, threatening the very survival of the empire. In this beleaguered and embittered atmosphere, Non-Muslims in general were viewed less charitably and more suspiciously as weak links or potential traitors. Legal restrictions against the activities of non-Muslims that had been only loosely or intermittently applied during the more cosmopolitan era of Ottoman expansion now began to be applied more rigorously. While Christians were more suspect than Jews, it was the Jews who were more vulnerable, both because they were less numerous and because they had no foreign homeland whose influence could be used in their behalf. In addition to official discrimination, Jews, like other non-Muslims, were subject to being harassed with impunity by Muslims, including children who could throw rocks at them, spit on them, or hit them, secure in the knowledge that no retaliation was possible under pain of death. These developments were not peculiar to the Ottoman Empire, but were widespread throughout the Islamic world, and were worse in many other parts of that world. In parts of Morocco, Jews were required to go barefoot when they ventured outside their own enclave, and an 18th century Jewish visitor to Morocco described his co-religionists there as oppressed, miserable creatures, having neither the mouth to answer an Arab or the cheek to raise their head. Jews were even pulled out of their synagogues on their Sabbath to do forced labor. As late as the 19th century, in Cairo, even the lowliest Arab did not hesitate to beat a Jew for such trivial things as daring to pass a Muslim on the right. In Yemen, Jews were required to clean the public latrines, and Jewish orphans were taken away to be raised as Muslims. Ironically, Jews living in parts of North Africa and the Middle East after European imperial powers conquered these areas now found themselves better off than under their former Muslim rulers, even though many of their ancestors had fled European persecution to find more security in the Islamic lands. Over the centuries, Europe had changed, as the Islamic world had changed. Under pressure from European powers, the Ottoman Empire began to reform and modernize, ultimately granting equal citizenship to all in 1869, regardless of religion. But by then, the Jews of the Ottoman Empire had fallen far behind the Jews in other parts of the world. Modern Europe The modern era that began for the world when the two hemispheres learned of each other's existence and began to interact was, for the Jews of Europe, 
an era when both progress and tragedy reached unprecedented dimensions. At the dawning of the early modern era, most of the Jews of the world were still living in the Islamic countries. However, with the passing centuries, the Jews' deteriorating position in a declining empire led many to immigrate to Europe, where the worst persecutions of the Middle Ages now seemed to be over, and where, in any event, economies were advancing and political systems were relatively stable. Law and order were especially important to Jews, who were a small, vulnerable, and conspicuous minority in country after country. By and large, Jews supported the emerging and growing nation-states of Europe, which had the power to protect them, even when those states did not provide equal rights. Secessionist nationalities seeking self-determination seldom had Jewish support, a fact bitterly remembered and revenged when these nationalistic movements eventually succeeded in establishing independent nations, as during the disintegration of the Habsburg and Ottoman empires after the First World War. In early modern Europe, the Jews lived separate lives, symbolized by the ghettos that existed in various forms across the continent. The separation was more than physical, however. Christians and Jews lived in separate worlds of the mind and spirit. They followed different traditions, not only in religion, immensely important as that was to both in that era, but also in customs, dress, language, food, education, and demeanor. The separation of Christian and Jew, initiated by a militant Catholic Church during the era of the Crusades, was virtually complete in much of early modern Europe. Yet the Jews, whose occupations from peddlers to international financiers kept them in contact and continual interaction with Christians, could not remain wholly unaffected by dramatic changes in the European world around them, which was moving to the forefront in science, philosophy, technology, and economic achievement. Those Jews who were urban, educated, and working in professions that brought them into more contact with the higher levels of European culture were, of course, more cognizant of these changes and their implications than were the masses of Jewish peddlers or artisans scattered through the agricultural hinterlands or gathered in small villages where life seemed to go on as always since time immemorial. All regions of Europe did not advance equally. Throughout most of the modern era, the spearhead of the progress of European civilization was in Western Europe, England, France, the Netherlands, and the Germanic lands, stretching from the North Sea through what is today Austria. Jews were forced out of much of this region during the late Middle Ages, so that the population center and cultural center of European Jewry had shifted from Western Europe to Eastern Europe by the early modern era. Most Ashkenazic Jews no longer lived in the Germanic lands from which their name derived, but in largely Slavic regions to the east. More important, Jews began the modern era living in the more backward lands of Europe, and those Jews remaining in the more advanced parts of Europe were largely insulated from the intellectual and cultural sources of that advance. Even within the Poland-Lithuania region, where most European Jews were now concentrated, the more advanced western and northern regions were served by a German middle class, while in the more backward eastern region, Jews dominated trade. Modernizing tendencies of various sorts slowly but inexorably began eroding the barriers between Christians and Jews in Europe, and eventually eroded also much of the traditional meaning of Christianity and Judaism. Intellectually, one of the byproducts of the Renaissance of the late medieval and early modern period was a renewed interest in scholarly research on the ancient world, which included the Old Testament that Christians and Jews shared as a sacred text. Associated with this was an interest in the Hebrew language and in Judaic writings. A linguistic and philosophic basis was thus created for discourse among Christian and Jewish scholars, though that discourse began haltingly, sporadically, and amid warnings against it by co-religionists on both sides. Politically and economically, the rising nation-states and empires in Europe found the skills, entrepreneurship, and capital of the Jews very useful in strengthening their respective countries' military forces. During the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, many discriminatory restrictions against Jews were removed, as the contending European countries sought the aid of Jewish financiers to carry on their expensive struggles against one another. 
The erosion of restrictions against Jews within Christian Europe was accompanied by an erosion of control over individual Jews by autonomous Jewish community authorities, who were progressively undermined as the rising secular nation-states strengthened their direct rule of subjects or citizens at the expense of intermediary institutions such as the nobility or religious bodies. To varying degrees, individual Jews were attracted away from Jewish traditions, not necessarily so much as to convert to Christianity, though that happened in some cases, but one could remain a Jew and yet adopt some ideas or practices of the surrounding Christian world. In places and times where the Gentiles' hostility abated, amid the philo-Semitism in vogue in some high places in the second half of the seventeenth century in Europe, for example, there need be no sense of betrayal of one's people in reaching out to a wider intellectual or social world. Nevertheless, the process was not painless, as different segments of the Jewish community differed greatly, and sometimes vehemently, as to how far to go. Some men would shave their beards and discard traditional Jewish dress in order to move more easily among Gentiles in their business or profession. Some rabbis would countenance Jews going to the theaters or opera houses of the Gentiles. Some venturesome Jewish congregations would introduce choirs, stained-glass windows, or other external features borrowed from Christian churches into their own houses of worship. Yet few went so far as Spinoza, who denied the divine origin of Judaism and was expelled from the Sephardic community of Amsterdam. The loosening of traditional religious ties and discipline among Christians facilitated a reaching out of those on the fringes of both communities toward each other. The Catholic-Protestant split of the sixteenth century and the bitter, devastating, and ultimately futile wars that grew out of their struggle for supremacy made religious tolerance seem more attractive and for some made religion itself seem less attractive. Movements to grant civil rights to Jews spread across Europe, beginning in the early 18th century in France, though it would be generations later before civil equality before the law was achieved, at varying dates, in different parts of the continent. The historically decisive event was the granting of civil equality to all French citizens in 1791 in the wake of the French Revolution, making this the first time in Europe that Jews were recognized as equal before the law. This civic equality then spread across the continent in the wake of Napoleon's conquering armies, and though the reconstitution of the old regimes after Waterloo marked a setback for civil equality for Jews, the status quo ante was not wholly restored everywhere, and by the mid-nineteenth century civil equality for Jews was becoming more widely accepted. Along with this movement for civil equality of individuals, there developed an appreciation of Jewish traditions. Both tendencies originated within the educated elite of Christian Europe, and the resistance they encountered among both the elite and the masses was formidable. Nevertheless, the groping toward mutual understanding between Christians and Jews was historic in itself and in its longer-run consequences. When eminent individuals of the non-Jewish world, such as Milton and Rembrandt, showed respect for and interest in Jewish tradition, Rembrandt actually lived in the Jewish quarter of Amsterdam, it was perhaps inevitable that such eminent Jewish individuals as Moses Mendelssohn should reach out toward the ideas and philosophy of the wider European world. Unlike Spinoza, Mendelssohn remained a Jew and a defender of Judaism but set it in the broader context of the 18th century Enlightenment and of Western philosophy in general. He was an historic bridge between the Jewish and Christian worlds, not only by what he said and did, but also by the respect and admiration he evoked from the Christian world, including the praises of Immanuel Kant. Gentiles as well as Jews mourned his death, and other Jews followed in his footsteps to participate more fully in European culture and contribute to its advancement. Among Christians, Mendelssohn's call for religious toleration and separation of church and state continued to be echoed after he was gone. His son became a leading banker in Berlin, and his grandson one of the great composers of classical music. With the passing generations and centuries, Jews increasingly produced historic figures, not simply within the Jewish tradition, but in Western civilization and of world stature. The great classical economist David Ricardo was descended from Sephardic Jews in Holland, though he himself no longer followed Judaism and lived in England.
Many of the intellectual giants of the 19th and 20th centuries were likewise of Jewish descent, Marx, Freud, and Einstein being perhaps the best known. Although no Jew was awarded a Nobel Prize until 1905, 16% of all Nobel Prizes over the next 70 years went to Jews, who were never as much as 1% of the world's population. At more mundane levels as well, Jews became not only a part of Western civilization, but also a major influence in its development. The nature and strength of that influence vary greatly from country to country, and especially as between Eastern Europe and Western Europe. At the level of the masses, as well as the elite, the Jews of these two regions of Europe grew more dissimilar over time, the Western European Jews becoming more assimilated and part of the larger society around them, while Eastern European Jews remained more isolated in their own traditions and their own social world. The modern era also saw a subtle but fateful change in the character of anti-Jewish hostility. In medieval Europe, as in the Islamic lands, Religion was the central pivot of anti-Jewish animosities, even if the impelling force was envy or resentment of their success. However, Jews who converted to Christianity, or to Islam in the Muslim world, were relieved of the disabilities which applied to those who continued to adhere to the Judaic faith. In some particulars, both social and legal, converts might encounter some barriers or limitations, but even these tended to erode away with the passing generations both in Christian and Muslim lands. Conversos in medieval Spain were not the only offspring of Jewish ancestors to rise to prominence or power after religious conversion. This happened in Muslim countries as well, and in 19th century England, Disraeli became prime minister at a time when no practicing Jew was permitted to sit in parliament. By contrast, later anti-Semitism focused on ancestry, on descent from the race of Semites. This racial and pseudo-scientific anti-Semitism emerged in the late 19th century and was the kind of anti-Jewish animosity that later actuated Hitler and the Nazis, to whom an individual's religious or non-religious views meant nothing during the Holocaust. This hostility to Jews as a people, quite aside from religious differences, was articulated at least as far back as Voltaire in the 18th century. Eastern Europe the widely shifting national boundaries of Eastern Europe over the centuries, including the appearance and disappearance of whole nations, such as Poland, makes the separate national histories of the Jews in this region not only more difficult to follow, but also less meaningful. Jews in a given location might belong to several different countries in a span of a few generations. In addition, Jewish settlements expanded territorially with the expansion of the Polish Empire in the 16th and 17th centuries, and many Jews were later incorporated into Russia as the Tsars took over formerly Polish territories. Similarly, some Ottoman Jews became Eastern European Jews without moving, as the boundaries of the Ottoman Empire were pushed back toward Turkey. Despite many local variations, the history of Eastern European Jews can therefore be considered as a regional history rather than national histories. Substantial numbers of Jews lived in Eastern Europe since medieval times at least. Many fled there as a refuge from the lethal mass violence that struck them when the Crusaders passed through Western Europe. In addition, Polish ruler Boleslav specifically invited Jews to settle in his domains in the 13th century, providing for their protection as well as their separation from Christians. Eastern Europe, then as later, lagged behind Western Europe in economic development, education, urbanization, skills, and the general cultural development of its masses, however much its elite might produce geniuses of world stature like Tolstoy or Dostoevsky. Jews were sought as a source of Western European skills much lacking in Poland. In other parts of Eastern Europe, though without such formal recognition of their role, Jews likewise provided much-needed artisan skills and provided a largely backward peasant society with such complementary occupations as peddlers, merchants, moneylenders, and manufacturers. As a literate people in the predominantly illiterate world of Eastern Europe, Jews were also useful to the landowning nobility as rent collectors and to the government as tax collectors, both roles tending to provoke hostility from the general populace. The Christian religion and the Catholic Church as an institution 
were both relatively recent features of Polish life when the Ashkenazic Jews began arriving there in medieval times, so religiously based hostility toward Jews was far less prevalent then than in later centuries, when the Christian clergy eventually succeeded in turning Poland into one of the most anti-Jewish countries in Europe. Christian merchants, artisans, and others who competed in the same occupations as Jews were also contributors to Polish anti-Jewish hostility. The offsetting liberalizing influences of the Renaissance and of early modern thought were slow to reach Eastern Europe, historically a region on the fringes of European culture, as exemplified by the relatively late arrival of Christianity in Poland in the 10th century. The two great regions of Europe had in fact differed since ancient times, when the Roman Empire extended over Western Europe and became an enduring cultural influence there. The Slavic lands of the East remained beyond the borders of the empire, and for many centuries thereafter looked to the West for new technology and new ideas. Jews were only one of the conduits of Western European culture to Eastern Europe. As the modern age dawned, an enormous transfer of Europe's Jewish population was already underway. Waves of persecutions, expulsions, and mob violence in various parts of Western Europe from the mid-15th to the late 16th century, led to an exodus of Jews to the east, to Eastern Europe as well as to the Ottoman territories in the Balkans and the Middle East. Whatever the variety of immediate causes of these anti-Jewish outbreaks, the larger pattern of expulsion of Jews from the West and their acceptance in the east reflected the widely differing need for their skills and talents in the two regions. Western Europe was well supplied with Christian artisans, merchants, literate professionals, money lenders, and other occupations in which Jews specialized. Indeed, it was often these Christian competitors who whipped up popular hostility and promoted official discrimination against Jews. This common pattern existed even in Spain, where many of the Christian competitors had themselves been Jews before the mass forced conversions of the 14th and 15th centuries. In those regions where the particular skills and talents of the Jews were in especially great demand, Eastern Europe and the Balkans, for example, rulers found it worthwhile to encourage Jewish settlement and to protect them from popular hostility. In the year 1500, there were an estimated 30,000 Jews in Poland, but by 1575, there were an estimated 100,000 to 150,000 there. This rapid growth of the Jewish population continued, as most German Jews migrated into Poland. The Jewish population was not evenly spread across Poland, but became concentrated in the less developed eastern regions of the country, while German artisans and merchants remained dominant in the western and northern Baltic regions of Poland. For the Jews, Poland was not simply a country with less persecution than they had known in Western Europe. It was a place where a far wider range of occupations was open to them, Jews were tanners, soap makers, glaziers, fur processors, distillers, and clothiers, as well as middlemen marketing agricultural produce and managers of the estates of noblemen. The jewelry business in Poland was almost entirely in Jewish hands. Culturally, Poland became the new capital of world Jewry. Talmudic academies, which had once flourished in Germany, now became prominent in Poland as the Ashkenazim settled there. Literacy became widespread among Polish Jews, as even the children of poor Jews were enabled to attend school with subsidies from the Jewish community at large. With the spread of printing, costly handwritten manuscripts were replaced by much less expensive books, thereby spreading Jewish writings even to families scattered in isolated villages in the rural countryside in Poland or the Ukraine. Behind these economic and institutional facts, was a strong tradition of respect for learning and intellectual endeavor, which made many individuals and communities sacrifice to achieve education. Literacy and an emphasis on intellect added to the other sharp differences between the Jews and the largely illiterate Polish peasant masses by whom they were surrounded. They literally spoke different languages. The Ashkenazic Jews of Poland continued to speak Yiddish, a dialect of German, as it existed before the exodus from Germany, together with an admixture of Hebrew, Slavic, and other words, varying in proportions from place to place. Polish military expansion to the east in the 17th century brought Jews into the Ukraine, where thousands worked as peddlers, small tradesmen, or craftsmen, 
and some as managers of Polish noblemen's estates in the newly conquered lands. Eventually, the oppressions suffered by the Ukrainians led to an armed revolt in 1648, led by Cossacks with the help of Tatars from the Crimea. The brutal and indiscriminate massacres of the vengeful Cossacks especially took thousands of lives of Polish noblemen, Catholic clergy, and Jews. Being more numerous than the other targeted groups, Jews bore the brunt of the losses. For the Jews, it was a loss of life not to be exceeded until the Nazi Holocaust, nearly three centuries later. Nevertheless, the Jewish population recovered demographically and economically within a generation. By the end of the 17th century, the combined kingdoms of Poland and Lithuania contained an estimated 350,000 Jews. Among other Eastern European countries, Bohemia Moravia's Jewish population was approximately 50,000, and that of Hungary, 10,000. As of 1700, Prague alone had 11,000 Jewish residents, making it the largest Ashkenazic community in Europe. As elsewhere, most of the Bohemian Jews were poor peddlers and traders. In general, Eastern European Jews tended to live in self-governing communities, autonomous in their internal affairs, and watchful over their members, lest they provoke the surrounding society by ostentatious dress, rowdy behavior, or ill-advised words. Such self-governing Jewish communities were not unique to Eastern Europe. They occurred elsewhere across the continent and in Islamic countries. But Eastern European self-restriction was tighter. Among other things, this meant that Eastern European Jews were more sealed off in their own world from the intellectual currents of modern Europe. Within their world, the Jews developed their own trends and fashions, but these had little or no connection with the outside world of Christian Europe. Among the Messianic Jewish movements originating in Eastern Europe was Hasidism, which emphasized spiritual, more so than intellectual, devotion to Judaism. But, as regards the outside world, neither the 18th century Enlightenment nor 19th century attempts at assimilation or accommodation to the outward practices of the larger society had nearly the influence among Eastern European Jews as among Jews in the West. This meant that Eastern European Jews remained not only alienated from Christians, but also, to an increasing extent, from their changing co-religionists in Western Europe as well. This alienation among Jews was felt on both sides. By the mid-19th century, followers of Eastern Europe's own Jewish modernizing enlightenment, or Haskalah movement, were referred to sarcastically by their more traditional compatriots as Berlinchiks, imitators of German Jews. Poland, the heartland of Eastern European Jewry, disappeared from the map in the late 18th century, as Russia, Prussia, and Austria divided its territory among themselves. Along with the territory of Poland, Russia acquired large numbers of Jews. In 1795, there were approximately 800,000 Jews in Russia, a country with a centuries-old tradition of anti-Jewish policies, including a 1727 decree by Catherine I banning them from the country. The Tsarist regime did not want its newly acquired Jewish population spreading throughout the country, so the government confined them to regions including some, but not all, of what had been Poland and some less developed regions in the southern part of the Russian Empire. This was called the Pale of Settlement, and Jews were forbidden to live beyond the Pale. Moscow and St. Petersburg, for example, were beyond the Pale, as were Warsaw and Kiev, at least for a time. Thus, the Jews, though highly urbanized elsewhere, had less than 20% of their population living in cities of 10,000 people or more in Tsarist Russia. The Russian government also began a decades-long campaign to Russify the Jews through such heavy-handed methods as conscripting their young men for more than 30 years of military service. Other conscripts served 25 years, during which they were forced to eat pork, make the sign of the cross, and otherwise violate Jewish tradition, and be pressured to become Christian in religion and Russian in culture. The long beards and long coats traditional among Jewish men were also forbidden, and policemen carried scissors with which they were authorized to trim the beards of any Jews they encountered on the streets who were caught violating this law. One of the underdeveloped regions of the Russian Empire in which Jews were permitted to live was the area around the Black Sea land recently conquered by Russia from the Ottoman Empire. Here there developed the port of Odessa, 
where Jews were one among a number of non-Russian minorities who settled and contributed to the economic growth of the area. Agricultural colonists in this region produced nearly one-fourth of Russia's grain exports. Odessa's businessmen were noted for their indefatigable pursuit of money. Its workers were paid far more than similar work brought elsewhere, and Odessa became the primary port of entry for goods from Asia on their way to markets throughout Europe. Like other nationalities, the Jews specialized in particular sectors, as bankers, agents, brokers, and traders in tobacco and oriental goods. By 1842, Jews owned 228 businesses in Odessa and constituted just over half the people engaged in trade in the city. In this developing frontier region, Jews were free of many of the restrictions which applied elsewhere as to where they could live or the occupations they could follow. Their success, however, came back to haunt them. In 1871, there was an outbreak of mob violence against the Jews of Odessa, instigated by their business competitors. Anti-Semitic policies in Russia were at their peak during the reign of Tsar Nicholas I, 1825-1855. His son, Alexander II, began a process of reducing or repealing some anti-Jewish policies, but, despite hopes raised earlier in his reign, his policies stopped far short of the emancipation or civic equality found in other European states. When Alexander II was assassinated in 1881 by a member of a group in which Jews and other minorities were prominent, anti-Semitic riots broke out in Russia, and the new Tsar, Alexander III, began a new wave of anti-Semitic policies. Sporadic outbursts of anti-Jewish mob violence, often unchecked by police or even with the active participation of policemen and soldiers, became recurrent events in the Russian Empire, on through the decades leading up to the First World War. The shock of these first pogroms of the 1880s set off one of the great mass exoduses in history. Between 1881 and 1914, more than a million and a half Jews immigrated from Russia to the United States alone. From all of Eastern Europe, more than two million Jews immigrated to the United States during this period. Many other Jews fled to other European countries or to North Africa or the Middle East but at least three-quarters went to the United States, just as three-quarters of the Jewish emigrants of this era originated in Russia. During the period between the two world wars, and especially during the 1930s, the political, social, and economic position of Jews in Eastern and Central Europe deteriorated drastically. Many of the newly independent nations of this region were carved out of the old Austro-Hungarian Empire after its defeat in World War I. Poland reappeared as a nation after more than a century, and Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and Latvia were created as sovereign states by the victors at the conference table. As in the case of newly emerging nations in Asia and Africa after World War II, the small, largely peasant Eastern European nations turned their newly won power against their own domestic minorities, of whom the Jews were the prime targets. Although the Jews of this region were by no means all prosperous, and many were in fact very poor, a disproportionate amount of the commerce of the area was conducted by Jews, who were also prominent in the professions and the press. As of 1921, more than three-fifths of all the commerce in Poland was conducted by Jews, who were only 11% of the population. In 1931, just over half the private physicians in Poland were Jewish. The Jewish working class consisted largely of craftsmen, shoemakers, bakers, tailors, rather than workers in large factories or mines, who tended to be Polish. Of the Polish Jews in commerce, nearly four-fifths were in one-man operations, small shopkeepers, rather than owners of businesses large enough to have employees. Few Jews were hired by the Polish government, however. Out of nearly 29,000 railroad employees, for example, fewer than 50 were Jews. Less than 3% of school teachers hired by the government were Jews, and Jewish professors were virtually unheard of in Polish universities. Nor were Jewish doctors hired in state hospitals, or Jewish lawyers retained by state institutions. Much the same situation existed in Hungary. On the eve of World War I, 60% of all merchants in Hungary were Jews. In the capital city of Budapest, Jews were 42% of the journalists, 45% of the lawyers, and 49% of the doctors. 
Many also held important government posts, and hundreds held titles of nobility. By 1920, half of all lawyers and three-fifths of all doctors were Jewish, in a country where Jews were only six percent of the population. While there were many poor Jews in Hungary, Jews were also prominent among the more prosperous classes. Nearly half of all industrial enterprises in Hungary were owned by Jews, as were more than three-fifths of all large commercial firms. Most Hungarian Christians were in agriculture, a sector in which only four percent of the Jews worked. In short, there were two entirely different occupational patterns as between the Jews and the Gentiles in Hungary. The same was true in Romania, where nearly three-quarters of the non-Jewish population worked in agriculture, while four-fifths of the Jews were in commerce or industry. The over-representation of Jews in commerce, industry, and the professions was usually an indication of the backwardness of the particular region. In the more backward eastern areas of Poland, 88% of all commerce was conducted by Jews, while in the more advanced western areas, formerly part of Germany, just under 8% of the commerce was conducted by Jews. In Lithuania, a much poorer country than Poland, Jews conducted more than three-quarters of all commerce. In Romania, as in Poland, the more backward areas were where Jewish predominance in commerce was greatest. The relatively small numbers of truly wealthy Jews were more likely to be found in the great commercial and industrial centers, where they were seldom a majority, while the masses of Jewish peddlers, small shopkeepers, and others at this much lower economic level were often virtually the only non-agricultural people in many backward peasant communities. Here, this latter kind of Jewish economic dominance was particularly likely to excite envy and anti-Semitism among the ignorant population and provide a statistical basis for political demagoguery. As in so many other backward countries with more advanced minorities, the newly rising indigenous middle classes of Eastern Europe spearheaded the attack on those whose competition threatened their career aspirations. Universities in Eastern Europe became centers of anti-Semitism and fascism in the interwar period. In some Polish universities during the 1930s, Jewish students were forced to sit in segregated areas of classrooms and were subjected to violence, including several murders. In 1934, Nazi propaganda minister Josef Goebbels gave a lecture at the University of Warsaw, attended by leading Polish officials. Among the subjects covered were the Nazi views on the Jews. Throughout Eastern Europe, by one means or another, the proportion of Jews among university students generally declined. Responding to widespread convictions that the emerging Polish middle class could advance only by displacing Jews, the Polish government established control over those industries in which Jews predominated, such as tobacco, liquor, salt, and matches. Boycotts of Jewish businesses in Poland during the 1930s, sometimes supplemented with violence against their owners or customers, led to a decline in Jewish-owned stores, both absolutely and relative to the total numbers of stores. Occupational licensing laws and the rules of medical and journalistic professional associations also excluded Jews from many occupations. In Hungary, similar restrictions were imposed during the 1930s, though less effectively administered. One ironic casualty of this anti-Jewish atmosphere was the anti-Semitic Prime Minister, Bela Imredi, who was forced to resign when his political enemies revealed that he had a Jewish great-grandfather. The crucial role of rising indigenous middle-class aspirants as the political base for obsessive anti-Semitism is indicated by lower levels of anti-Semitism in places and times where such classes had not yet emerged, for example, in late 19th century Hungary, or in Lithuania, as late as the immediate post-World War I years, or in places where a long-established non-Jewish middle class was well able to hold their own in competition, as in the Bohemian province of Czechoslovakia or in Latvia. Among these latter middle classes, however, were members of the German minority, who, during the 1930s, came more and more under the influence of Nazi Germany, adding to the problems of the Jews. The assimilation of many Eastern European Jews to the German language and culture, in parts of Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Latvia, for example, did not help, nor did the high degree of assimilation of Hungarian Jews. More generally, the degree of Jewish acculturation or assimilation to the society around them 
had little or no effect on their ultimate fate. During World War II, approximately 2.7 million Polish Jews were murdered by the Nazis, and another 350,000 escaped into the Soviet Union. By 1945, only 85,000 remained alive in Poland, and another 230,000 in the USSR. Some of the survivors were killed in anti-Semitic outbreaks of violence by the Poles. Initially, many Jews returning from the Soviet Union after World War II benefited from the establishment of a communist satellite government in Poland. Although the pre-war Communist Party in Poland had only 5,000 Jewish members out of a total Jewish population of more than 3 million, nevertheless Jews were 26% of the Communist membership. They received many important posts in the government and economy of early post-war Poland. While this brought Jews some immediate material benefits, it also made them the focus of much Polish hatred of a dictatorial regime imposed by their historic enemies, the Russians. When anti-government agitation and riots erupted in the 1950s and 1960s, Jews were special targets, and were especially treated as expendable by the communist authorities. Many were purged. More than half the Jews in Poland emigrated to Israel between 1950 and 1958, and another 17,000 left between 1969 and 1970. By the late 20th century, there were only about 10,000 Jews, including offspring of mixed marriages, in Poland, this in a country which had more than 3 million Jews before the war. The tragedy of the Jews in Poland was repeated, with local variations, in other parts of Eastern Europe and the Balkans. In Hungary, Romania, and Czechoslovakia, for example, Jews were historically overrepresented in the leadership of the Communist Party, as they were in Poland. When a communist dictatorship was briefly imposed in Hungary after the First World War, its leadership was overwhelmingly Jewish, and the political retaliation after its overthrow was, as in Germany, anti-Semitic. In Hungary, the reaction included the murder of 1,800 Jews in 1920, and a heightened and lasting anti-Semitism throughout the society. In the Nazi Holocaust a generation later, half or more of the total Jewish population of Hungary perished, despite resistance by the Hungarian government and the heroic efforts of Sweden's Raoul Wallenberg to aid their escape. The post-war imposition of a communist government on Hungary again brought many Jews to prominence, and they were, as in Poland, later sacrificed in purges to appease both Stalin and domestic anti-Semites. By the late 20th century, there were an estimated 75,000 Jews in Hungary, less than 10% of the pre-war Jewish population. Post-war Czechoslovakia, Romania, and other Eastern Bloc countries also went through periods of the waxing and waning of Jewish fortunes, associated with 1. the early installation of communist satellite governments, 2. Stalin's anti-Semitic purge policies in the late 1940s and early 1950s, and 3. the changing foreign policies of the communist bloc toward Israel and the Islamic nations of the Middle East. Native anti-Semitism also played a role, and this varied from country to country and by region within countries. Backward Slovakia was a particularly anti-Semitic region of Czechoslovakia, for example, while Bulgaria was historically much less anti-Semitic and had the highest rate of survival of Jews during World War II of any Axis nation. Throughout Eastern Europe and the Balkans, the post-war Jewish population was a tiny fraction of its pre-war size, with aging and intermarriage producing further declines. The key nation in Eastern Europe was, of course, the Soviet Union. The Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, which created the USSR, had a disproportionate number of Jews among its leaders, Leon Trotsky being the most prominent, and raised hopes among other Jews of an end to the savage anti-Semitism that had marked so much of Russian history. Many of the Jews among the communist leadership had long since ceased to think of themselves as Jews, even in a social or cultural sense, much less a religious sense. Yet many of them later learned to their shock and disillusionment that others, including their comrades, still thought of them that way and singled them out for hostile treatment. Like other ethnic groups in the USSR, the Jews were initially allowed a certain cultural autonomy in the 1920s. But the reaction set in during the 1930s when Stalin's purges struck. 
thousands of Jews were among the intellectuals purged. Jews aroused a special suspicion as a highly visible group with international kinship and cultural ties in a totalitarian state attempting to seal its population off from outside corrupting influences such as Trotskyism, democracy, or knowledge of the higher standards of living in other countries. Jews were even more of a political problem during the period of Stalin's collaboration with Hitler, beginning with the Nazi-Soviet Pact of August 1939, which paved the way for World War II. The Soviet Union's Jewish foreign minister, Maxim Litvinov, was replaced by V. M. Molotov prior to the accord with Nazi Germany. In the nearly two years that elapsed between the Nazi-Soviet Pact and the Nazi invasion of the USSR, the Soviet Union annexed vast areas of Eastern Europe containing approximately two million Jews, among the other peoples of that region. Located in the area of bitterest fighting during the Nazi-Soviet War and of Nazi extermination campaigns in occupied territories, Jewish casualty rates were proportionately several times those of the Soviet population as a whole. Nevertheless, Jews remained under suspicion as the only Soviet people with strong kinship ties to Western nations and the democratic tradition. The emergence of the modern state of Israel made the loyalty of Soviet Jews still more suspect. Communist press campaigns against homeless cosmopolitans stopped short of explicit anti-Semitism, but government policy did not. Jewish cultural organizations were shut down. Purged individuals were often referred to by their Jewish names, even when they had long been known by Russified names. Executions on bizarre charges eliminated virtually the entire cultural leadership of Soviet Jewry. Jews were barred from the Soviet Foreign Service, where they had once been prominent. Many Jewish students and professors were purged from institutions of higher learning. In the last days of Stalin, a plot by Jewish doctors was fabricated and publicized the fabrication later being admitted by the Soviet government itself after Stalin's death. The entire period of World War II and the post-war era were times of greatly heightened Russian nationalism, with attendant subordination of the role of minority cultural identities. Jews suffered from this general pattern, as well as from being singled out as special targets. The focus of the Soviet attack was primarily Jewish identity rather than Jewish ancestry. Soviet Jews without ties to the Jewish people and willing to be hostile to Israel, for example, could and did survive and thrive. One of the leading Soviet intellectuals of this era was Ilya Ehrenberg, who was of Jewish ancestry, but who declared, There is no such entity as the Jewish people. People of Jewish ancestry thus continued to be overrepresented among the educated classes, among Communist Party members, among doctors and lawyers, and in the Soviet Academy of Sciences, even though restricted de facto from the foreign ministry and the top levels of the armed forces. Nevertheless, the emergence of newly educated classes among some Soviet nationalities, such as Central Asians, led to notions of ethnic balance in organizations open to such people and ethnic balance meant career obstacles to Jews, an overachieving group without the political clout to protect themselves, like the Slavs. Despite official attempts to undermine Jewish identity, the effect of Israel on Soviet Jews was electrifying. The first appearance of Golda Meir at a Moscow synagogue in 1948 caused the usual High Holy Days attendance of 2,000 to rise suddenly to nearly 50,000 demonstrative people. The longer-run effect was even more dramatic. Between January 1968 and June 1973, more than 62,000 Soviet Jews immigrated to Israel, despite enormous obstacles put in their way. This was more than all the other Soviet peoples to emigrate in half a century of communist rule. The reaction of the Soviet government took many forms. They tightened emigration restrictions, drastically reducing the outflow creating an entire class of rejected emigration applicants known as refuseniks, people not allowed to leave and also subjected to discrimination and harassment for having applied. The most famous of these was Anatoly Sharansky, later known as Natan Sharansky, once he was free to take the Jewish name his mother preferred, but which she had dared not give him in the USSR. The Soviet government also sharply restricted the opportunities of Jews in general. 
Between 1970 and 1977, the number of Jews admitted to Soviet universities dropped by 40 percent, from approximately 112,000 to just 67,000. Almost none were admitted to Moscow State University. Jews were especially excluded from the sciences. In the mathematics department at Moscow State University, Jews were once 30 percent of all students in the late 1940s, but by the early 1970s were only 1 percent. These repressive measures in turn brought into play the special access of Soviet Jews to the West, and especially the Western media. An estimated one-third to one-half of the leadership of the Soviet dissident movement was Jewish. This was an especially ironic role, in view of earlier Jewish prominence among those in the forefront of the drive to create communism in Russia and the Western world. 